Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2019 Royal Tyrol Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrol Museum and its collaborating society are proud to present our very own Dr. Don Brinkman. Don is originally from Craigmile, Alberta. Growing up in southern Alberta, he developed a passion for paleontology at an early age while collecting fossils in the Alberta Badlands. Wanting to turn his passion into a career, Don decided to enroll in the paleontology program at the University of Alberta. After completing his bachelor's degree, Don moved to Montreal to pursue his PhD at McGill University, where he studied the structure and function of the ankle joint and diapsid reptiles. Upon completing his PhD, Don was hired by the Museum of Co Cooperative, uh, Comparative Zoology at Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts to help upgrade their collections. This work involved identifying and cataloging a large amount of fossils collected in Permian rocks from Texas. It is during the final year of this project that the Royal Tyrol Museum was established and that Don was asked to join the ranks of the resident paleontologists. Don occupied the role of Curator of Vertebrate Paleontology from 1982 to 2007 and became the Director of Preservation and Research in 2007, a role he occupied until his retirement last November after 36 years of service. But retirement hasn't slowed him down. Don now holds an emeritus research position at the museum and he comes in every day to continue his research without the frequent interruptions of bureaucratic responsibilities. <laughs> Don's research interests focus on two main areas, the taxonomy, biostratigraphy, and distributions of Mesozoic turtles, as well as the use of Cretaceous vertebrate microfossil assemblages to study paleoecology and vertebrate distribution. Over the years, he has conducted fieldwork in Canada, China, Mexico, Argentina, and the United States. Today, Don will talk about the use of cutting edge technology in the study of fossil fish from Alberta. So without further delay, I present you Dr. Don Brinkman. Thank you, Francois. Okay, um, I just want to first acknowledge uh, that what I'm presenting is uh, results of a team of researchers, sort of a network that have been working on related projects, uh, including uh, Andy, Julian DeVay, Alison Murray, and uh, Michael Newberry. And uh, to start with, uh, just to give some context, uh, I often get asked, you know, since I work on fossil turtles, what am I doing with fossil fish? And this actually goes back to when I started here in 82. When I had my interview, they told me that uh, uh, they wanted researchers working field-based research projects looking at paleoecology. So looking at how animals lived, interacted, the environment they lived in, uh, and that sort of thing is the focus. Um, and uh, my area was the non-dinosaur vertebrates. So uh, this, this whole paleoecology was, was sort of the, the theme of the museum. Uh, it's how the exhibits are, are constructed, and it's how uh, it's, it's sort of established the research direction of the museum uh, and the direction we've gone uh, starting in 82. Um, one of the aspects of this work was the work by Dave Eberth looking at the environments. And this is a reconstruction he did of Dinosaur Park uh, in the Cretaceous. A very wet environment, uh, lots of big rivers uh, permanently flowing. And uh, there's clear evidence from the fossils that within this rivers there's a very uh, complex and well-developed uh, aquatic community so that uh, some, of the, some of the most obvious uh, members of the aquatic community that we were seeing in the, uh, in the fossil record were the reptiles, the things like the turtles, uh, the crocodiles, and the champsosaurs. Um, but these were only part of the community. We knew for, for that, that there, was, uh, there was a lot of fish there and that these reptiles were interacting with the fish. For example, the Champsosaur has a long slender snout with needle-like teeth, which is a kind of adaptation that's uh, present in many fish eaters. And uh, we were also seeing coprolites with uh, fish bones in them. So that, uh, you know, it was clear that uh, if, if one was going to understand the communities fully, you had to understand what kinds of fish were there in what sort of uh, relative abundance 
and then ultimately how they changed over time. So uh, the challenge was that fish are, are uh, very, there's a very biased record in terms of how fish are preserved. Articulated specimens are very rare. Um, this is the only articulated specimen of a small, smallish uh, uh, teleost fish. Uh, it's about uh, six to eight inches long. It's a skeleton of the body missing the fins um, in an ironstone nodule. And uh, this was collected uh, by the Royal Ontario Museum uh, early on when they were doing field work there. So I spent, uh, you know, whenever I was in the park uh, doing field work, I was always paying attention to the ironstone nodules. And uh, there was a, a broken trail of ironstone nodules uh, wherever I went for many years. And, uh, but I never saw anything like this. Uh, it remains a unique specimen. One of the few other articulated specimens uh, is this brain case of a long-snouted fish called Bellinostomus. Um, so that, that uh, the record from articulated specimens is, is, is very, very sparse. But what there is, uh, is uh, lots of isolated elements uh, typically preserved within concentrations that we call uh, vertebrate microfossil localities. And uh, this is a picture uh, taken uh, during uh, early, early uh, surveys of the park. Uh, if I remember right, it would be about 1983. And uh, uh, at a locality called the Railway Grade, which is one of the more richest localities in the park. Uh, these sort of localities had been known since the 60s as areas where you could find small, uh, rare animals. So a process of, of uh, collecting them using uh, bulk sampling had been developed. Uh, and I, I started uh, bulk sampling microvertebrate localities in 1985. Uh, the process is very simple. You just sort of bag up bags of the rock, take it, soak it, screen it in the, at that time I was screening it in the river, and sorting through uh, under the, the concentrate under the microscope and pick out the fossil bones. Um, this, uh, the, the bottleneck in this work is the sorting. This is, this is the holdup in processing the, uh, the samples. And this is an area that uh, volunteers have played a, a large part. Uh, the picture in the bottom is uh, a group in Calgary uh, members of the Alberta Paleo Society that get together in the winter pretty much every other weekend uh, after Christmas and uh, spend two and a half hours at Mount Royal University uh, in their geological lab sorting uh, microvertebrate concentrate. And uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, the work Jane Denis has done in sorting uh, concentrate for many years at the museum. So um, a, a lot of stuff came out of that. So uh, the end result are lots of isolated bones. And the problem is then is how do you identify these? With some taxa, and especially with sharks, there's an established uh, set of characters you can look at. So you can look at shark teeth and know what kind of shark it's from and, uh, um, and get down to very low taxonomic levels. And this is, this is uh, also the case with some uh, primitive, shark, primitive uh, bony fish, things like sturgeon and uh, paddlefish, gar, amia. You can, you can, the bones are very distinctive, so you can recognize those from the uh, isolated elements. And the earliest, uh, one of the early studies of, uh, of these microvertebrate assemblages by uh, Richard Exties in uh, 1964 um, these, this is the diversity of fish that he recognized. Uh, mainly these, these basal bony fish uh, and uh, rare, uh, rare teleos fish, more derived fish. Uh, so the one teleos fish that he recognized was Peralbula, um, a relative of the modern bony tongue. The problem was that uh, everybody who, who worked on this material recognized that there was, uh, there was lots of diversity. They just couldn't put names on, on what the taxa were present. And because they couldn't put names on it, they weren't included in the faunal lists. So as a result, um, you know, they recognized that there's higher diversity, but, but uh, they just didn't know what it was. So weren't, weren't, uh, didn't, we didn't know what kinds of animals were there, what they were like. 
in order to use them in these kind of paleoecological studies. So this was the uh, situation when I started, and uh, uh, my and and like the other researchers, I was seeing lots of different kinds of elements, um, but couldn't put names on them. So uh, my approach was to recognize them as morphologically distinct types, so morphotypes, and uh, and treat them, uh, you know, try evaluate whether or not these morphotypes were likely represent ta uh, distinct taxonomic groups, and then give them arbitrary uh, letter designations, and then treat them as taxa and looking at distribution patterns. And uh, uh, the, re the results of that was, was that uh, it was possible to look at the total diversity in terms of the number of taxa, the size, the distribution. So, for example, I was able to uh, do a series of studies uh, going from uh, the very base of the uh, late Cretaceous into the Paleocene and look at changes of diversity over time. Also, I was able to look at uh, geographically going from Alberta south to Utah and look at geographic patterns. So, for example, um, could recognize distinct faunal events at periods of which uh, rapid uh, change over short periods of time. And for example, this one, uh, where a number of taxa dropping out and some coming in uh, seem to tie in with a period of glo high global temperature. So these were the kinds of sort of paleoecological questions we could look at from, from looking at these uh, uh, isolated elements as morphotypes with what, without what, knowing what kinds of, of, uh, of fish these represented. So, uh, so there was a fair increase in understanding of, of the role of fish in the paleoecology of the late Cretaceous. But it left a gap in terms of, uh, of connecting it with modern faunas and knowing what kinds of, uh, of fish were there and, and how they related to modern ones. So that uh, the, the challenge then and, and something that's been ongoing and what I want to focus on is to the rest of the talk is this challenge of identifying these isolated elements, how we do it, and some of the kinds of results we've gotten. So and this, is, this is just a quick example. One of the, uh, one of the types of, uh, of uh, center that we saw has a very distinctive uh, pattern of articulation with the skull uh, that's found in, in the derived teleos, the uh, things like the perch and, uh, and, uh, uh, and other derived groups. And we could recognize these vertebrae and look at their abundance over time. And they first appear um, in very low down in the uh, late Cretaceous. And in successive uh, assemblages become uh, uh, more common to where they're uh, in the, in the uh, early Paleocene localities, typically uh, 70 per 60 to 70 percent of the, uh, uh, telio of the teleos centra that are present are a member of this group. So a clear change that relates to, uh, to modern uh, assemblages in terms of a derived fish becoming increasingly more abundant throughout the record. So, what I, so, the, so the challenge is all these other morphotypes that I'm recognizing, what kinds of fish are they? Um, the place to start obviously was looking at skeletons of recent fish. And where we knew a fish was there looking at its uh, at its uh, living relatives. And one of the fish we knew were there, um, based on the work of Estes, was this one, Parabula, represented by uh, uh, isolated teeth that are, and, uh, that are from a, uh, a tooth plate where they're stacked on top of one another in this tooth plate. So uh, this one, Estes had, had suggested, is related to the living uh, bony tongue. Uh, a fish found in uh, warm temperature waters uh, today uh, and is important as a sports fish. Uh, looking at the type of vertebrae that, uh, that we see in the fossil record, there is one um, that I had designated centrum type F that, uh, that compared favorably with the uh, recent albula. Um, especially the, the being relatively short in the pattern of uh, of uh, articular surfaces, so that uh, 
and, and to uh, confirm this, this type of centrum was only found in localities where the teeth of uh, Parabula were, were uh, of very high abundance. So that uh, this, was, this was one success in terms of identifying a centrum uh, morphotype by comparing with recent skeletons. And fortunately, there's uh, big collections of recent skeletons uh, in Canada, one in uh, Royal Ontario Museum and another in Ottawa. So I was able to uh, use those to look at, uh, at, at uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of living, different kinds of living fish. Uh, one that I was able to look at based on skeletons of our collection because they came from the Red Deer River was the hyodon, the gold eye. And uh, there was a, uh, the first vertebra in the vertebral column of the gold eye had features that I was seeing in one of the fossil uh, centrum morphotypes and was able to identify this centrum uh, morphotype as being from gold eye. So tie in that, uh, that, that uh, fish with, uh, uh, with the living fish. Uh, this was a biogeographic interest because uh, 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 the gold eye, the, relative, the only other fossil of go, uh, relative of the gold eye uh, that had been uh, had been uh, widely recognized was in Asia, and it suggested that there was uh, interchange in these small freshwater fish from Asia into North America early in the late Cretaceous. The presence of interchange is not unexpected because there's lots of evidence from dinosaurs of them being similar. But what this does is give uh, a little more uh, data on the nature of this uh, of this interchange because this is a obligatorily freshwater fish. And uh, so it's got to be, the, the connection has to have a fully freshwater uh, uh, possibility of connecting between these two land masses. One of the big surprises in terms of the identification from comparison with recent skeleton is this one. Uh, this is one that was recognized by Mike Newbery. And he, he recognized that this distinctive hinge uh, at, the, at the front of the lower jaw is present in, uh, and in, in a group uh, called Crassiforms. So the Crassiforms are a group of uh, fish that are uh, uh, southern hemisphere in their distribution um, today. And their fossil record is, uh, uh, suggests that they originated in, in uh, uh, southern hemisphere, Africa and South America, and uh, were restricted there. Uh, I didn't get into North America until the uh, North America and South America connected um, in the late tertiary. So, so the, the identification of this was based on the similarity of this hinge structure of the uh, specimen from Dinosaur Park compared with the recent, uh, one of the recent crass forms. Examples of crass forms that we'd be familiar with are some of the aquarium fish, the tetras, as well as um, the piranha from South America is a, is a crassiform. Uh, they're they're uh, members of the Osteriophyce, uh, so they're they're uh, related to catfish and uh, cyprinids, and uh, are a very important group of uh, modern fish. And I'll be talking about those more later. Uh, so this uh, morphologically, this is is very strong similarity. It's a structure that's present in all crassiforms and it's present in no other fish. And the similar, similarities are in, in very fine details. Uh, the angle of the ridges, the way the ridges expand. So that uh, we were, we were uh, very confident in the identification. Uh, the problem is this uh, sort of paleogeographic pattern in that, uh, that it's a South American group. And uh, how did it get into North America at this uh, time period in late Cretaceous? Um, and there's no, there's very little other evidence for exchange, especially of small freshwater things. So because of that, it's been viewed uh, um, skeptically uh, by a number of researchers. They, they look at it and say, yeah, it's similar, but um, we need more evidence that it really is a member of, the, uh, of that group. And the evidence they'd like to see is, is a feature of, of, of a stereophysons uh, that's unique to them, which is the Weberian apparatus. Uh, the Weberian apparatus is a, is a modification of the anterior vertebrae of the vertebral column that uh, uh, transmits sound and, and enables them to hear. Um, we were able to 
compare isolated vertebrae with vertebrae of crassiforms and uh, recognized one uh, that had a strong similarity with the anteriormost centrum of the uh, vertebral column of the crassiform, which is part of the Werberian apparatus. So we had this suggestion that the Werberian apparatus was there. Um, and with this similarity and with comparison of recent uh, uh, skeletons, we're able to identify um, uh, other vertebrae as being from this same kind of fish, but uh, uh, at yet can't point to anything in, beyond this and saying that this is further evidence for, uh, for this fish being uh, uh, a crassiform. So that's, that's some of the, some of the, the uh, results that come from, the kind of results that come from comparing with recent skeletons. Uh, the other obvious thing to do is compare with fossils. And there's a few fossils that uh, are, are particularly relevant. And one is uh, uh, this one, Notogonius. Uh, Notogonius is one of the large fish from uh, the Green River Formation. Uh, and we've had a specimen on exhibit in Fossils in Focus last year. Uh, it's known from uh, two specimens from Montana, from the Cretaceous, from beds that are roughly equivalent to the age of Dinosaur Park. <clears throat> and this is, uh, this is a picture of, of one of those specimens. Um, so that uh, we know it's there in the Cretaceous and uh, uh, there's every reason to expect then that it should be in Dinosaur Park. The problem is that when you compare with the uh, articulated skeleton, you can't see the kind of features that you can in the isolated elements. So I'd never been able to uh, point to an articulated specimen and say, this is a feature that, I, that allows me to identify uh, isolated centra as being from this kind of fish. And then within the last couple of years, uh, a study was published by Julian DeVay and Alison Murray that <clears throat> was looking at isolated elements from uh, beds that were equivalent to the age to the Green River Formation. And uh, they were able to, to identify uh, isolated centra as being from uh, an articulated specimen of Notogonius uh, based on uh, these comparisons. So they were able to see enough details uh, to identify that. And once they had illustrated the isolated elements of Notogonius, so I had that level of detail to compare with. Then I was able to uh, go through my material and see elements of the same kind. So especially, for example, this one being, being similar to that one. So based on, on uh, uh, being able to compare with the isolated elements from, from the uh, Eocene of fish that were identified by comparing with articulated specimens, then I was able to identify one of the, uh, one of the taxa from Dinosaur Park as being uh, this Notogonius. And uh, a second uh, uh, taxon that they, they identified was this one, Diplomistus. Again, <coughs> they had isolated elements from the Eocene uh, that they were able to identify as Diplomistus from, from uh, comparison with articulated specimens. And I believe uh, Julian actually uh, prepared out, took, took a specimen, prepared out the uh, center in three dimensions so we could make that comparisons. And uh, with those, then I was able to compare with, with the elements from Dinosaur Park and make the identifications. So, um, for example, <coughs> this is the Dinosaur Park specimen compared with the specimen from, from the Eocene. And this is from uh, fairly back, far back along the vertebral column. This is the same comparison from uh, anterior on the vertebral column. So, uh, and what really, really confirmed it in my mind was this element here. This is, this is uh, an element that I had seen uh, a number of times in, uh, in uh, some localities in Dinosaur Park. In fact, Jane had picked out several examples from the material she was sorting. Um, but I couldn't tell what the element was. It was clearly a midline element. It had an articular surface, but I couldn't tell if it was from, from it didn't look like a vertebrae. Uh, I was thinking maybe it was from the very front of the skull, but they were able to identify it, this, the uh, equivalent element as being the base of the brain case. 
so the element that the, the vertebrae articulate with. And uh, because, of, because of this, then this, this added confirmation that, the, the, uh, the, that it was Diplomistus that uh, I was seeing as the isolated uh, centra, that, that that taxon was present in uh, Dinosaur Park. Um, <clears throat> a third one that uh, uh, Mike Newbury was able to identify uh, was Prisca cara. <coughs> Excuse me. This this fish, uh, spiny teleost fish, and uh, uh, in this case, the jaws were visible on on specimens of Prisca cara that could be uh, could be identified as isolated elements. So that uh, uh, we were able to start uh, recognizing that Green River fish. Taxa present Green River fish uh, extended back into the Cretaceous and are present, were swimming in the rivers that uh, flowed across Alberta at the time of deposition of Dinosaur Park. Um, there's a few other specimens that uh, uh, were of note and very useful for identification. One is this one. This is uh, one that was collected in the Alberta Sorbonne bed uh, in Dry Island. Um, it was described by Mike Newbery as a, as a herring um, related to Diplomistus. And for me, the significant thing about this specimen is that uh, uh, there's two isolated vertebrae from the anterior portion of the vertebral column that were, uh, were separated and present in three dimension. So uh, Jim McCabe spent you know, several hours, days, uh, preparing them and uh, was able to get them in three dimension and then compare with the fossil material uh, and recognize them in Dinosaur Park. So this, this one, especially with that flat uh, ventral surface, um, uh, is, is a feature seen in one of the morphotypes from Dinosaur Park. Uh, and also uh, uh, their lower jaws uh, that matched up, especially with this very restricted round uh, Symphysial surface there, so that uh, this taxon Horseshoe Ixthes uh, was able to identify as as being present in uh, uh, at the time of deposition of Dinosaur Park. Another specimen that turned up recently uh, that uh, was of interest is this one, uh, uh, currently on exhibit in the uh, uh, in the galleries. Uh, it's a block with five articulated fish from uh, collected during excavation of a basement in Calgary uh, in a new subdivision. <clears throat> so this is a this is a specimen where the loca uh, locality information is a street address, and uh, uh, is currently behind the basement walls. But there's there's five fish on it. Uh, they were studied by Allison Murray, and she recognized that there's two distinct kinds. Um, differing in, in especially the structure of the tail, one having a, a longer, uh, more gracile tail and one having a, a, a shorter, deeper tail, as well as the whole fish being, uh, being deeper. Um, these are, are uh, late Paleocene in age. Um, and uh, in one of these fish, uh, you could see a couple of views of the vertebral uh, centra. Uh, that were enough to be able to uh, match them with uh, fossil specimens from Dinosaur Park. Uh, so that surface there being equivalent to that surface there. And this surface there with that process coming out being equivalent to that surface with that process coming out. So um, was I able to identify these as, as being from uh, a related group of fish. Um, another locality that offers uh, you know, a total new insight into these late Cretaceous ones is the Pisces Point locality. Uh, previously, you know, been restricted to uh, comparing it with fossils of younger age and different localities. Uh, but with this locality, uh, it's unique in the late Cretaceous in that it's got a diverse assemblage of of uh, small articulated fossil fish of, uh, and of, of teleos fish. And from the same formation, we have microvertebrate sites with isolated elements uh, 
presumably from the same kinds of fish. So this offers uh, the possibility of a whole new insight into ter terms of identification of, of these uh, fossil fish. Uh, one of the first ones to be studied is this one, uh, named Wilson Ichthys, and uh, it's a, a, a early primitive osteoglossomorph. There's uh, some of the vertebrae visible on the side here. Uh, you can see parts of the centra partly over, overlain by ri uh, ribs, but enough that I could make comparisons with uh, two types of uh, centra that I'd recognized as isolated elements. These, these centra morphotypes were, um, were, were separated by features of the uh, dorsal surface and of uh, uh, the ventral surface. Um, and they both compared with, with the uh, seen in lateral view and the articulated specimen of Wilson Ichthys. So I could, I could say it could be one of these two, but I couldn't say which one because I couldn't see the centra of Wilson Ichthys in uh, the same view. Um, another specimen from Pisces Point that uh, again is, is uh, phylogenetically very important and tantalizing in terms of identification of uh, isolated elements, but somehow frustrating is, is this one. It's an early pike. Um, uh, you, know, you can see the long body and, uh, and, uh, and uh, similarities with the, uh, with the living pike. Previously, the earliest uh, known pike was uh, uh, one uh, Esox uh, timani from northern Alberta. And it's so similar to the modern pike, it was put in the same genus, uh, even though it's uh, something like 50 million years uh, younger, uh, sort of older than the living, living uh, genera. So that um, we've got a complete skeleton that we can compare with and, and look at questions like uh, phylogenetic relationships. Um, based on a number of studies, the, the closest relative of the living pike is one uh, mud minnow called Novumbra. And uh, you can see it's clearly different in terms of a, a short skull and, and a rounded tail rather than the forked tail and, and elongate skull. The uh, specimen from Pisces Point is more like Esox in having a elongate skull. However, the tail, and uh, this is complete, uh, even though the picture isn't great, uh, is more like November and having a, uh, uh, a rounded tail rather than the forked tail uh, like the modern Esox. So phylogenetically it's significant in terms of being an intermediate and uh, will be the closest known relative of Esox. But in terms of identification, again, it's, it's uh, uh, tantalizing but doesn't solve the problem because um, you can't see the features that uh, you need for identification. Uh, there's two pike that have been recognized uh, based on fossil material and given names based on tooth structure. So one, Estes Esox, has very small teeth in multiple rows, and the other has, uh, Old Man Esox, has larger teeth in a single row. Uh, but uh, you can't see the, uh, whoops, uh, can't see the, uh, the tooth row, that's, you just see a little bit of the dentary there. So that uh, even though it's an articulated specimen, we can't say which of these taxa it is. And similarly, we can't see the vertebrae on it. So we can't, uh, so we're left, uh, uh, left tantalizing, but not having questions answered. And uh, one of the really, uh, again, very tantalizing specimens is this one. Um, you can see it, does, it's, it doesn't, it does looks, looks a difficult specimen to photograph because of the color, but it's a full skeleton with the skull and tail. And the field identification, it was a, a stereophysin. Uh, and I talked about stereophysins earlier with crassiforms. Um, <clears throat> if you look them up on Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia will tell you that uh, they're the most common group of freshwater fish that, uh, Roughly three quarters of all freshwater fish are, uh, all kinds of freshwater fish are members of the Asteriophyce. Um, and 
uh, the, the common, common ones are catfish, um, uh, suckers, cyprinids, and then, then the crassiforms. Uh, I'd mentioned the Werberian apparatus. The Werberian apparatus is this structure right at the back of the skull. And this is a drawing of a Werberian apparatus in more detail. It's, a, uh, it's got a series of bones that are connect, connecting the swim bladder to the brain and uh, transmits sounds from the swim bladder to the brain so it's able to hear. So basically this is, uh, this is uh, a fish with a specialized hearing mechanism and uh, presumably part of the reason it's so successful. Um, so you know, to identify something as an Wisteriophyson, uh, the question is, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the Werberian apparatus like? And uh, if this Cretaceous one is an Osteriophyson, it should have a Werberian apparatus and should give us information in terms of what the structure of a very primitive Werberian apparatus is like. I had, uh, I recognized vertebrae from the Cretaceous that I were uh, identifying as a Osteriophyson. And uh, uh, with, with this series of vertebrae representing from various parts along the vertebral column, and one of particular significance was, uh, had a structure on the side, which I was arguing was the uh, 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 equivalent to this feature on, on uh, the recent uh, uh, cyprinids on the Werberian apparatus. And that structure is significant because it's the articular surface for one of these ear ossicles or, or hearing ossicles uh, that is, is functional part of the Werberian apparatus. So the question was, uh, you know, did this, did this fish have, have this type of vertebrae? Um, one, there was one that was just visible in end view, just enough to make comparison. So this is what we could see in end view, and this compared with, uh, with the fossil specimens that I was identifying as the first vertebrae along the vertebral column of a, of a Osteriophyson. <clears throat> so, uh, so there was reason to suspect this was a, was a uh, uh, Osteriophyson, but how do we how do we confirm that? And and an interesting possibility came up a couple of years ago, at a talk that was given at uh, meetings held in Dinosaur Park by the Canadian Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. Uh, somebody Han, Hans Larsen from McGill gave a talk on a new uh, uh, facility that they had established that was doing CT scans at the micron level. So a micron is um, a thousandth of a millimeter. So you're getting down to the really, really tiny. And uh, um, then had the possibility of looking, I felt, had looking at these really, really tiny fish. And uh, they were flattened, but at that kind of level, um, even a flattened uh, fish fossil is, is fairly three-dimensional. So we, we sent a uh, specimen out there to try, and, and it was, we did get, uh, we did get uh, nice distinct separation of the bone and the matrix. So um, the step, so we, we tried a couple of things. We did the whole fish at uh, 25 microns. And this is a reconstruction of the, uh, of the whole fish from the, from the uh, CT scan. So it does a bunch of slices. You go through each slice and highlight the uh, the bones and then stack them together and remove all the non-bone highlighted material and what you end up with is, is the skeleton. Um, the part of the animal of interest, the Werberian apparatus, was in this region right at the back of the skull in the front of the vertebral column. So we did that at 10 microns and uh, this, is, this is the results we've got. So uh, uh, this is um, about five millimeters of, of that, uh, of that uh, skeleton. Um, with this, uh, you could start working it digitally and basically digitally dissect out the elements. So we started by highlighting all the things that were vertebrae and ribs um, without, uh, and, uh, uh, and then removing, digitally removing the non-vertebrae ribs elements. Um, there's some, uh, some of the shoulder girded elements in there as well. So the things we could recognize clearly as, as ribs and, uh, and shoulder girdle and fins, then we removed those. 
So dissecting out uh, elements uh, and then left with the vertebral column and, and associated bones that we couldn't identify at this point. Uh, we knew the ovarian apparatus was formed by the first four centrum along the vertebral column. So we restrict it to that region. And so this is, this is, this is the candidate for the ovarian apparatus. So the question then, is it a ovarian apparatus? And start comparing with the, the, the recent ones and, and uh, seeing features that, that, uh, that allow a positive identification. And one of them is this expanded bone here which is a, a separate bone on top of the uh, vertebral column present in, uh, in uh, uh, the Weberian apparatus. Um, and then another is, is, the, uh, is this triangular bone, which uh, we know is not a rib. Uh, it's not uh, part of the shoulder girdle because we removed those elements. And, uh, uh, so identifying potentially as, as this one, the tripus, this is the, the largest of the uh, ossicles and the one that carries the vibrations from the swim bladder to the, uh, to the brain. Uh, so we could look at that at three dimension. And one of the features that uh, helps us positively identify that is this articular surface on the end of the, of the element. Uh, this is the element that would, the surface that would articulate with the vertebrae uh, allowing it to move and transmit the vibrations. So, uh, so we're, we're, we've identified this as a Weberian apparatus based on, on the presence of a tripus and the presence of that enlarged supraneural. Uh, the next thing was to look at the structure of the, of the centra. Um, uh, we could uh, uh, recognize and reconstruct from the CT scans each of the centra and look at them in three dimension and start looking at uh, the structure of the centra going from the front to the back of the column and then comparing with the fossil material. So that uh, the first, first centrum, uh, uh, so this is a comparison of the first centrum from the fossil with, with a uh, isolated first centrum from the uh, scholared formation, from the same formation as the fossil comes from. And uh, clearly, clearly the same thing. Uh, one, one particular of note is this huge opening at the ventral surface of the centrum, uh, very short with short transverse processes at the base. Uh, so we have, we clearly have identified the first centrum of, of the Weberian apparatus as a fossil by comparing with the, uh, with the digital reconstruction uh, of, the, of the element from the uh, articulated fish. Uh, a surprising thing was the first two centra uh, are, are, are uh, very similar. The only real difference I could see is these two pits were further apart in the second centrum than they were in the first. Um, and uh, based on that, we could identify uh, a possible second centrum as an isolated element. So, um, uh, so further identification of, of, the, uh, of the fossil. The third centrum uh, is, is of, of particular significance because this is a centrum that the, the tripus, the, uh, the, the uh, bone that carries the vibrations, uh, articulates with. And we could identify this. This is a fossil isolated centrum um, that we can identify by comparing with the digital reconstruction of the centrum from the articulated fish and uh, uh, has, has a distinct feature here that uh, uh, we can identify as the feature that articulates with the tripus. The fourth was, uh, was uh, a very complex element with lots of flanges, thin flanges and, uh, and deep pits. Uh, there was only one example of a fossil uh, that compared with the four centrum that I had seen. And this was not from the scholar formation. It was from formation of this uh, same time uh, in Wyoming, and uh, one of the features was a very large articular surface here uh, that compared with uh, with uh, the surface in the in the uh, articulated specimen, and the same arrangements of pits on the ventral surface and constricted centrum on the ventral surface. So that uh, I haven't seen this as as uh, as as an isolated fossil. I think because it's so 
uh, delicate and easily broken. It's just not, not often preserved. Uh, going back to the post Werberian centra, uh, these are the ones I had identified as post Werberian centra of the, of the uh, stereophysin. And the uh, striking similarity, it's a very large articular surface here um, and uh, relatively low wide centrum. So, uh, <clears throat> so that uh, from, so that what we're able to do with the uh, CT scans is confirm the identification of the articulated specimen as being a member of this group of, uh, of uh, called the Asteriophysin, uh, and uh, um, and, ident and confirm identifications of isolated elements as being from this kind of fish. So. The articulated specimen is one point in time, but the isolated elements are many points in time in many localities. So we can use those now to look at the uh, history of the group in North America. And uh, by looking at the distribution of those isolated elements, we know that the group first uh, arrived in North America uh, in the Tronian at this uh, time of faunal change. and. Uh, and uh, uh, because the Asteriophysins uh, are thought to have been uh, uh, southern hemisphere in their, in their origin and, and, uh, and early diversification, then this gives some evidence for some kind of uh, intercontinental dispersal at this time, presumably connected with this period of high global temperature. Uh, the other thing we can do that's quite striking is its distribution in North America. In uh, sites in Utah, it's consistently abundant. Um, nearly half of, of all Telios centra from localities in Utah are, are from one of this kind of Asteriophysin. Whereas in uh, equivalent beds in Dinosaur Park, it's, uh, it's very, very rare. So that uh, this seems to fit a pattern of latitudinal distribution where it was more common in southern, hem southern uh, latitudes than it was in north latitudes, which interestingly matches the uh, distribution of uh, catfish today because we don't have many catfish in the Red Deer River. So the other thing this does is uh, uh, we can go back look at crassiforms. Now we know what ovarian, elements of ovarian apparatus would look like as, as isolated elements. We can go back to collections and say, do we have any of these as isolated elements in uh, in the localities where we find the crassiforms. And uh, I'd, I'd previously identified this as uh, potentially the first, first uh, vert uh, vertebrae of the vertebral column. Uh, but now that we know what to look for, we can recognize this as being uh, a third vertebra. So the vertebra with the feature that articulates with the tripus. So this, this uh, gives uh, very strong supporting evidence that uh, there was a ovarian apparatus in this fish that we're identifying as a crassiform, and that really is, it really is a crassiform. So that putting them all together, then this is, uh, this is uh, the sequence of vertebrae. A first one, if it's like the uh, Osteriophysin, the second one would be morphologically similar to the first one. The third centrum, and then uh, fourth centrum not represented because of preservational uh, uh, biases. And then the more posterior centra, so we can start to look at the uh, vertebral column of this, of this crassiform and make comparisons with recent fish. So, um, so that's sort of the, the, uh, the approach that, uh, that, uh, that has been developed for identifying uh, these isolated elements. And, and some of the kind of results that uh, we're starting to get um, uh, just, just being able to identify that fossil as a, uh, as a, a stereophysin is, is significant because that's the first uh, detailed evidence of a Weberian apparatus in a, in a Cretaceous uh, a stereophysin. Um, and uh, uh, the, other, the other sort of big tape home message is that uh, Working together, the isolated and articulated fish can really give us new insights. The uh, articulated fish uh, give us information about the phylogenetic relationships uh, in a way that uh, the isolated elements don't. But the isolated elements 
uh, from microvertebrate sites, because they're so abundant and so widely distributed and, and uh, large sample size, gives us a chance to look at, uh, at their history within North America in, 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 a, uh, uh, in a, a much higher level of detail. So in terms of where we go from here, um, obviously there's a lot more to be gained from CT scanning uh, uh, fossil fish. Um, there's, there's a lot more specimens coming out of the uh, Pisces Point locality I'd very much like to see at the same level of detail as that of Stereopison. And also from the Green River Formation, there's, there's some very small fish from the Green River Formation that uh, uh, could be related to fish from the Cretaceous. And uh, um, I, I, now that we know what to look for, I really want to go back and look at the Karasiform in more detail and make, a, make, a, uh, make another case, uh, add more evidence for its identification, um, which will raise questions about dispersal and connections and, uh, and uh, how it got here. So uh, that's what I see in my future. Um, and, uh, 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 and I'd like to thank the museum for letting me keep, uh, keep working at it. <laughs> and uh, uh, have a lot of people to acknowledge uh, because this uh, kind of work, it stems from uh, support from a lot of people. So thank you very much and thank you for listening. <laughs>